Thank you, Minerva and Todd. Uh, and thank all of you for coming out uh, and listening and, and feeling that this race is important. It is very important. Uh, I keep stressing to people throughout the county of Los Angeles that the DA's office and the DA in general, and when John stood up here and said he, the DA, has never been a she, and hopefully this time the DA will be a she, because men don't occupy that office uh, all the time, and I think the voters need to tell them, you know, that that office doesn't need necessarily to be occupied by a man. But I try to tell the voters throughout Los Angeles County, guess what? Uh, the DA affects your everyday life. And no other office in the county of Los Angeles will affect the lives of individuals more than what happens in the district attorney's office. Why should you vote for me? I'm a 26-year veteran of the LA County DA's office. I've tried in excess of 200 felony jury trials, 40 of which have been murders, six death penalty cases. I was the first president of the Los Angeles County Bar Association, the first female African American president. That is the largest local voluntary bar association in the nation with a budget of over seven million dollars and a staff exceeding a hundred. So I have been elected by my peers. I know how to run an office. Uh, I know what's important in California and certainly in the county of Los Angeles. While in the DA's office, I supervised two offices under a Democratic DA, Gil Garcetti, and as soon as the Republican came in, uh, I was taken out of that supervisorial role uh, simply because I did not support him. Uh, I have uh, served on a number of state committees. I've served on a no number of local committees. Uh, uh, one of the proudest things I've done was uh, I served on the Webster Commission, which was the parallel commission to the Christopher Commission when we had issues after the Rodney King disturbance. And so it was my duty to go out to the Foothill Division of LAPD and try to figure out what went wrong. Uh, put forth a report and really um, talked about and uh, suggested a lot of things to the Los Angeles Police Department that they could do to improve their relationship with the community. So that's one of the proudest things that I have done. Why should you vote for me? Uh, I have a platform, and that platform is the following. And, and by the way, you shouldn't vote for me if you don't agree with my platform. Three things I want to accomplish my first year in the DA's office as the DA of LA County. The first thing, juvenile reform. There was a question that came up about juveniles. We spend over $200,000 a year per juvenile incarcerating juveniles. It costs less to educate someone, to send them not only to undergraduate school, but to send them to professional school. We need to wake up as a society. We cannot keep incarcerating juveniles. We cannot keep this recidivism going on. Someone's got to stand up to the plate. And who does that? The LA County DA does that because one, we represent the largest county in the state of California. Our office is the largest prosecutorial agency in the United States. The DA of LA County has credibility. And you've got to stand up to the plate and say, what has been going on for the last 200 years is not working. And when it's not working, we've got to change it. We are wasting money, folks money we cannot afford to waste. And so I want to reform that system. How are you going to do that? I'm going to put DAs in those juvenile courts who want to be there, who understand my philosophy about rehabilitation, uh, my philosophy about education, my philosophy about mentoring, my philosophy about coordinating and interfacing with administrators in the schools, with parents and making them accountable, and with DAs and professionals. Am I just doing that because I'm running for DA? Oh, no, no, no. In 2008, I chaired the first diversity summit in Los Angeles County. And what we did at that diversity summit is we had about 700 participants, a lot of elected officials, a lot of administrators within the school systems throughout the county of Los Angeles. We had students, the mayor came, uh, and judges and other professionals. And what we talked about was the pipeline system that the state bar has instituted in terms of mentoring. And what does that do? It puts professionals in touch with young people at a very early age. And we mentor those young people up until the time they are professionals and they're able to extend a hand to some other youth. I had a, a, a mentee, first Latina in her family ever to go to law school. 
graduated from Hastings, and now she's a member of the California State Bar. I started mentoring her when she was in high school, and she came and watched me in court, and she said, I want to be a uh, lawyer just like you. And I introduced her around to a lot of judges, and those judges said, yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't realize she was serious, and she was serious. I attended her graduation from high school, I attended her graduation from Cal State Long Beach, and I flew up to attend her graduation at Hastings. I never saw parents so proud than her parents that day. First generation law school lawyer. So when I say to you I want to reform that system, I mean it. The second thing I want to do, death penalty reform. We are spending billions and billions of dollars on the death penalty. I've tried six cases, more than anyone who's running in this uh, campaign. So I know what I'm talking about. I have four people on death row. Those four people will never be executed in my lifetime. You know why? Because the system is broken. I just retried in 2010 a death penalty case that was tried by another DA in the 90s. The worst thing in the world I ever had to do was to knock on the door of the 11-year-old victim in that case who was raped and tortured for two and a half hours and murdered. I had to knock on the door of her mother and say, we've got to do this all over again. Uh, that was horrible for me. The mother, her mother had to go through a horrible, horrible trial, a second trial, knowing that he may not get executed, knowing that guess what? After 20 years of appeals, she might have to do that one more time. We are not going to fix this system, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to do something about it. If it doesn't pass in November on the ballot, and I think everybody here, because most of us are Democrats, knows that on the ballot measure in November, there is going to be a ballot measure to uh, abolish the death penalty. It may not pass. And if it doesn't, the DA, the next DA, has got to step up to the plate and say, we've got to reform it. And I think, since I supported Kamala Harris, that I can work with Kamala Harris and the governor to talk about reform in that area. The third thing is environmental crimes. Uh, Mr. Cooley, through his 12-year tenure in the DA's office, has done one thing that has really bothered me, and that is his failure to step up to the plate in terms of environmental crimes. I want to rejuvenate that division. It hasn't been abolished, but we haven't been doing things in that division. Uh, when Mr. Garcetti was the DA, that was one of his projects. And he did a great job in terms of environmental crimes. I grew up in Compton, in the southern part of the county. I've watched how folks have dumped toxic waste all over, how nobody cares about that, uh, how they built large trucking firms in that city uh, next to schools. Nobody cares about that. Well, as the next DA of LA County, I care about that. And I want to tell you a little bit about Mr. Trutanich, who's running. Mr. Drutanich, prior to Mr. Gar uh, to Mr. Cooley uh, helping him become the city attorney of L.A. County, Mr. Tr of L.A. City, Mr. Drutanich was a defense lawyer, and he defended folks who dumped toxic waste. He defended environmental polluters, and I want you folks to understand that and to know that. And that is one reason why you shouldn't support or vote for Carmen Trutanich. So those are my three, uh, the three fundamental things that I would like to accomplish my first year as DA of LA County. If you don't agree with that, don't vote for me. Please don't vote for me. But if you agree with that, not only do I want you to vote for me, but I want you to donate to my campaign. Right here. <laughs> so, uh, so those are the reasons, and that's why I want to be your next DA. The other thing I wanted to make sure everybody knows is this. In 2013, when Gloria Molina is termed out, and if no one that is a female is elected to her seat, there will be no female elected officials in county government. Woo. Wow. LA County is the largest county in the state of California. If it were a state, it would be in the top 10. Does that make any sense? If Jan Perry, if Wendy Gruel, if neither one of those women 
make it as the mayor of LA City, we will not have one woman in city government that's elected. Does that make any sense in 2012? And that's why it's important for you as Democrats to vote for me. I am a true Democrat in the race. The true Democrat. The Democrat who stood up for Kamala Harris and voted for Kamala Harris. The Democrat who has always voted Democratic has never voted for a Republican. And there may be some good Republicans out there. I like John a lot. But as my philosophy is, even the best Republican doesn't beat the worst Democrat. It's just the way I feel. Our mission statement is so different. Uh, and my mission statement is very different from the Republicans running in this race. So with that, I will entertain any questions. And, and let me just tell you before you do, another reason you should vote for me is because I have been endorsed by Los Angeles County Democratic Party, by the Democratic Party of the San Fernando Valley, by the Stonewall Democratic Party, uh, I'm sorry, Stonewall Democratic Club, the Stonewall Young Dems, the West Hollywood, and uh, Beverly Hills Democratic Club, the New Frontier Democratic Club, the Gardena Valley Democratic Club. Uh, I can go on and on. I just uh, found out today uh, that not only have the Long Beach Democratic <laughs> Clubs voted, uh, endorsed me, but Long Beach Lambent today endorsed me uh, as the, the person uh, who should be the next DA of LA County. And the proudest endorsement that I have, the proudest endorsement I have, is my peers. The Association of Deputy District Attorneys has endorsed my candidacy. Now when your peers endorse you, that says a lot. That speaks volumes for the person who ought to take that office in 2012. I'm asking you to vote for me, and if this club endorses Minerva, Todd, I'm asking that you endorse me, and that uh, you stand behind me. Thank you. Questions? Yes, uh, same question. Uh, I don't want to get you in trouble with the uh, prison guard unions, but uh, if you are elected, what would you do to take the hand of the uh, uh, prison industrial complex out of my pocket? And let me tell you, that was, a, that was a very good question. What we have to do in California, because that's a huge problem, is we have to deal with overcrowding. How do you deal with overcrowding? You deal with overcrowding in the following way. AB 109 gives us a great opportunity, even though it's flawed, it gives us a great opportunity to deal with a lot of things on the local level. One, we should be spending our resources on violent offenders. Violence is bad, and that's what we ought to do. The nonviolent stuff, that's where we have an opportunity to deal with that at the local level, and therefore the overcrowding issue doesn't become an issue. And if the nonviolent offenders are educated, if the nonviolent offenders are rehabilitated, it reduces a lot of the money that goes into the infrastructure and into the commercialization and into the profit uh, of the Department of Corrections and of the private jails. So I think that's the way you do it uh, in California. And we have an opportunity to do that. We need to spend our resources on that. Most people don't realize that the budget uh, in, in the state of California, a lot of it, not only does it go toward education, but a lot of it goes toward incarceration. I mean, so much of it goes to the Department of Corrections. We are wasting our money with this continual flow of money into the Department of Corrections because people keep coming back and back and back. Uh, we're not re resolving anything, and that's why we need to take that money, we need to put it in educational programs, we need to put it in rehabilitative programs, we need to fund those programs, and AB 109 gives us a, a huge opportunity to do it. It is going to require you folks to go back to the legislature and tell them, instead of giving the chunk of money to the county sheriff, you need to give the chunk of money to the community programs, to the faith-based organizations, or even the non-faith-based organizations who work with programs that would cure the problem that you're talking about. Because if people don't keep going back to state prison, it puts them out of business. And maybe we ought to try to work toward that goal of trying to close many prisons. I'm, I'm, I'm so tired of hearing about the closure of schools. Let's talk about the closure of prisons because we're not overcrowded anymore. Shouldn't that be our philosophy? Because I think that should be our philosophy. I think that should be the next DA's philosophy. 
Don't play this your question. Yes, Steve. No, nothing hard. Oh. You can, there, there's nothing I could ask you, Danette, that you couldn't handle. I know you. So. Um, John, had, John had talked about uh, the DA's not having enough discretion, and I think at least I agree. John has been incredibly eroded under Steve Cooley. That we're required to give sentences even if we think it's wrong. I've seen it happen. Will you give greater discretion to DAs, particularly in nonviolent, non-serious crimes, uh, so we have the ability to consider rehabilitation, uh, alternate sentencing, uh, community service work, instead of just this mindless, mandatory jail time, regardless of the facts of the case? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question, and I do agree with John on that. Uh, when I first came into the office, we had a lot more discretion to do a lot uh, a lot of other things other than mandatory sentences. Uh, and that was just 26 years ago. And it has changed over the course and scope of the years that I've been in the office. Let me tell you what the problems are. One, head deputies uh, should be selected based upon uh, years of experience in the office and based upon what they have done within the office. Head deputies, those are the people who run the branch courts, should not be chosen because they give money to my campaign, because they go out drinking and eating with me, uh, or because they're my good friends. Because when that happens, there's a problem. Head deputies, if they're chosen correctly, if they're chosen appropriately, should be able to make those decisions. If you're running an office, you should be able to determine whether or not you should strike a strike. You should be able to determine whether or not a murder is a manslaughter. The DA does and should make decisions in cases that affect the entire community. No question about it that you should have a voice in that. When you've got a major hate crime going on and the police aren't doing anything, uh, the community is concerned about it, the DA needs to step up to the plate. But in the ordinary run-of-the-mill cases that we deal with on a daily basis, the head deputy should be able to decide those cases. More importantly, the calendar deputy who's in court should also have the discretion to dispo those cases. We need to stop running up to the office saying, let me check and see if we can do this. Because what it does is it reduces our power in a courtroom. It really does. When the judge gets frustrated because the DA can't make a decision, the victims are in court and they're wondering why you're a lawyer. Why can't you make that decision? Uh, we look stupid. And so yes, I would give more discretion, a lot more discretion to the head deputies. And the head deputies should give discretion to the assistants and to the calendar deputies. No question about it, it should happen in our office. And hopefully it will. And I guarantee you, uh, once I'm elected, it will happen. Yes. 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 Star Moffat. Hi, Star. My question that I have for you, well, before I ask you the question, you have made a statement in regards to the fact that the district attorney's office should work with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations, especially since AB 109 has gone into effect. My question to you now is, what has, the, what is the rate of persons that have been referred to these community-based organizations and faith-based organizations since AB 109 has gone into effect for nonviolent offenders? Well, quite frankly, since AB 109 has gone into effect, there are several things that DAs, uh, and I know, for instance, one of the things that's, that's a problem is we don't have a lot of uniformity in the DA's office. So for instance, what goes on where I work at the airport is very different than what goes on in Compton and what goes on in Torrance. Because the services are, that are available in each of these jurisdictions are very different. So let me talk about the airport, because that's what I know and what happens in the airport. Uh, because of AB 109, most, there, there are certain options with respect to nonviolent offenses. So if you have a defendant, let's say, who has state prison priors that are non-violent, non-strike priors, that person is going to serve their time at a local level. If there is a huge amount of restitution involved, what I like to do is say, you know what, I want to put you on probation, I want to put you in a facility, because I want the victim to get the money back, particularly elderly victims. And I encourage those kinds of sentences so that over the course and scope of probation, the defendant is able to pay back the victim, okay? A lot of times what you have, and this is the flaw with AB 109, is what you have is, you have people say, I don't want to be on probation, I want to do my time in the county jail, I don't want rehabilitation, all I want to do is my time, because once they do their time, there's no tail on them, there's no supervision on them. 
And so they can just walk away. They don't have to pay. They don't have to do anything. They can do their 16 months in county jail. That's a flaw, okay? At the airport, I would say we probably have more people going into rehabilitative, pro rehabilitative programs. A lot of them are non-faith-based. Some are. Uh, so I would say probably more than 50% of the nonviolent offenders under new AB 109 are going into rehabilitative programs. There's no question about it. I can't speak to what's going on around the county, and I can also tell you because AB 109 is so new right now, the numbers aren't really there. Uh, they have not, we don't even know right now how many people uh, are serving their full sentences in county jail because AB 109 has just gone into effect. And so the numbers aren't there. But I can tell you from my personal experience, handling a court, that about 50% of the people that I deal with are going into rehabilitative programs. Uh, many of them are faith-based, some are not. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> does anyone else have a question or I'm going to ask the last question for the night? What is your opinion on the three-strike rule? And I'd like to hear that from you and John. OK, and I'll hand this to you, John, when I'm done. I'll well, tell you, John, this one. OK, I'll tell you what my position is on three strikes. The third strike ought to be a violent and must be a violent or serious felony. And even if it is a violent or serious felony, the DA, the head deputy, should have the discretion to decide whether or not, even then, whether they want to seek a sentence of 25 years to life. Because sometimes people who have a third strike, and that third strike is a serious or violent felony, maybe it isn't appropriate for them to do 25 years to life. Now, I want you to know that I don't, uh, that, that my feeling about this, my opinion about this, isn't uh, because I'm running for DA. When the three strikes law went into effect, I spoke before a body of about 400, 500 lawyers at the Conference of Delegates at the State Bar of California. And I was part of and supported a resolution to try to deal with the three strikes law. That is to make it mandatory that that third strike be a violent or serious felony. Um, we've done that for, I guess, the past eight or nine years. We failed uh, because we can't get a legislator to carry that uh, piece of legislation because they're, I believe they all believe that if they do, they'll be perceived as weak on crime and therefore they won't get elected. Uh, they don't understand that it's incredibly costly to uh, house someone uh, for a petty theft who has three, two strikes for 25 years to life. We'd be incarcerating a whole lot of folks. So the present policy of the DA's office is the one thing I do like that Steve Cooley did. Just the one, just the, all over 12 years, that's the one. Uh, I believe he was correct uh, when he made the policy that the third strike should be a serious or violent felony.